thanks for uh, coming and thanks for all the efforts to organize this. I want to talk about uh, modules in Java. Well, before the time of Java 9, I, I used to say that Java 8 is the most important release of Java. Well, it was true because it was something that changed the way we program. But now I'm going to say that Java 9 is the most important release of Java. And the reason for that is, in, in the case of Java 8, it was an opt-in and opt-out. You decided when you want to use, what you want to use. But Java 9 affects every single person on the planet, as long as they have something to do with Java. And the reason for that is, Java 9 is not about how you code Java, it's all about how you deploy Java. So it's about building, it's about distribution, it's about how you bring dependencies in, all that is where the, the effort really is. So the first question, of course, is the big elephant in the room. You know, when people talk about modules, one of the often asked question is, why did they do it? Why couldn't they just use OSGI and be happy with it? Because OSGI has been around for a very long time. And, and the answer to that is really important to understand because the answer to that is also really the reason why they even bothered implementing modules. Modules are not about you and me. They didn't quite create modules for us. They created modules for themselves. And for a number of reasons. For example, if you look at rt.jar in Java 8, do you remember the size of rt.jar? 68 megs in size. Uh, what does it have? A better question to ask is, what does it not have? So, how many of you use Swing? Oh, one, two people raised the hand. Um, yeah, okay, well, uh, how many of us use Corba? Not a single person raised the hand. But the answer is, don't worry about it. If you ever need it, it's there. And the point is, this is like somebody's going on a trip. And you give them seven luggages, and they protest and say, what's this for? And you say, don't worry about it. If you ever need anything, it's there. So that was a big ball of mud we've been carrying around with us. Well, they really wanted to modernize Java. That's the very first thing they wanted to do. So one of the things I want to quickly show you here is a useful command you can look at, which is, of course, Java a dash dash list a dash modules will tell you the modules that Java has. And that way you can take a look at the modularized Java. Obviously, this will be a command you can use in Java 9 through future versions. And when I hit the return, that's a list of all the modules of Java that you see right there. You can see the Java base, and Java base is the mother of all modules. Every single module other than Java base depend on Java base. And so that's a mandatory dependency. Every other thing is optional. You don't need to really use them. For example, Java compiler, Java desktop, Java management, Java net HTTP, and so on. And there are several of them. How many is the question? Well, the answer, of course, is it depends. So if I do list modules, and if I were to run this command in Java 9, you would see, uh, you would see about you are take 98 modules. Now, had you run this command on Java 10, you would have seen 78 modules. Now in Java 11 and later, you're going to see about 70 different modules. So they got rid of about 28 modules in the two versions already. So once they modernized Java in Java 9, they didn't remove anything in Java 9. It was kind of like, hey, look, we modernized it. Everything is in bits and pieces now. And then they said, gosh, that's 98 of them. We quite don't need Java FX for everything we do. We don't need Corba for everything we do. And so they started stripping them out. And so as a result, we have about 70 different modules over here. So that's one thing you can do is to run the list modules and see how many modules you have available. And of course, you can take a look at what the modules are by just doing a listing of that and taking a look at it, looking at it as well. Now, that's the first thing is they want to really modernize Java for their own sake. Now, I was listening to Mark Reinhold, the project manager for Java, 
And, and somebody asked him, uh, why did you guys take five years to implement it? And he was, he was visibly shaken with that question. And he, he said, what do you mean five years? He said, we took 20 years to implement, he said. And that's important to keep in mind because this is not an easy problem to solve. And they've been working on this for decades, actually. And then so they've been chipping away and working towards modernizing Java. So part of the reason is they wanted to really break this into smaller pieces. But more important, you know, how do you make Java more secure? Now think about this for a minute. You have a class in your jar file. You did not make that class public. Why didn't you make it public? Because it's your internal stuff. It's your business. Now I come along and I create a jar file and I name my package exactly the same as your package. And of course, because the name of the package is the same, I sneak in and use your class. And you run this code, what does Java do? Java says, hey, that's kind of funny. There are two jar files with the same package. It shrugs its shoulders and keeps going. So the point is, we're not supposed to do this, but we could in the past. And also, if a class is marked as don't use, what do people do? They use it. And then when they say don't use it, and they get angry because they've been using it for a long time. So what if we can really make private as private? What if we can bring true encapsulation and make Java more secure? That's another thing they wanted to build. The third thing is, in the, in the versions of Java 8 and, and earlier, I'm gonna say Java worked in the in-laws mode. What do I mean by in-laws mode? You're leaving home without the key, but the in-law doesn't tell you, right? The in-law see the key and say, I wonder when they'll find out they didn't take the key. And at three in the evening, you frantically call home and say, I need the key, I don't know where it is. Oh, sweetie, it's right here. I just didn't want to tell you, I want to see how long you took to find it. This is how Java worked, isn't it? You take your time and build those 90 jar files, and you give it to the production team. And as they're walking to production, they drop one or two jars on the floor, and they deploy the other jar files. <laughs> now, what does Java do? It starts running. At the fateful moment when the user clicks on the button, at 2 a.m. on Wednesday, what happens? Your phone drinks, and they say, your code sucks, come fix it. And you're like, what's the problem? And, and, and the family is upset, right? Because you woke everybody up with the phone call. And then you say, it's a class not found exception. How do you feel about it, right? Well, if your class is not found, why do you start running? And Java now works in the mother mode. And what I mean by that is, she comes to you and says, I know you've got a busy day. I don't want you to leave without the keys and make sure the keys are with you. So in other words, Java works in the fail fast mode. So if you don't have something, your code won't even run. We're going to see this a little bit later. And the last thing I want to mention is, how do you know what your dependencies are? You know, if I tell you that you have a jar, would you be able to tell me what your jar file depends on? What other jar files you actually need? Well, the answer is, the dependencies are really hard to maintain. The other day, somebody was very quick to answer and said, oh, that's not a problem, he said. Uh, and I said, gosh, how do you know what your dependencies are? And he said, why I use Maven? I have to deliver the bad news to him. You don't use Maven, Maven uses you. <laughs> and, and even if you're used by Maven, that's only compile time dependency, isn't it? It's not a runtime dependency. So at one time, how do you know what your dependencies really are? Well, what if Java can build a dependency graph for you? And you can take a look at the dependency graph any time you want to, because the dependency graph is part of your metadata. So your jar file not only contains your code, but your jar file also contains your dependencies with it and clearly tells what are the things you need to compile your code, to run your code, and, and such. So as a result, the dependency can be used at compile time for verification. It can be used for runtime as well for failing fast and for performing other checks as well. And we're going to take a look at that. The minute we build a jar file, we'll examine that. So enough of that talking, let's talk about how we can actually use it. So what is really a module? A module is stuff we do, the stuff we create. It's your classes, your interfaces, your events, your data. It's whatever you normally write in Java goes into a module. So earlier we used to create jar files, now we're going to create jar files which are modules. 
So module is just a packaging and but with a few rules, however. And the rule of the land is uh, modules cannot share packages. So if you have a package, uh, I cannot create a module with the same package. Neither can you. Once you have one module, that module can have the package, the package cannot be duplicated anywhere. So what's going to happen if two or three modules contain the same packages? Well, when you start the program, if two modules in the module path, we'll talk about module path a little later, if two modules in the module path contain the same package, we both get kicked out. Because Java says, I don't know which one is authentic, get out and it quits working. So you're not allowed to have packages that go across modules, so as a result, it can make your code a little bit more secure. So how do we really create a module? We're going to get to that in a minute. Now, when it comes to this module, you can require other modules, but you can export your packages. So in that regard, you this is a little confusing in the beginning, but you require modules, you cannot require packages. You can only export packages, but require modules. The reason this is this way is, it's based on this principle called the reuse release equivalency principle. The reuse release equivalency principle says, what you should be able to reuse is the same as what has been released. Here's the way to think about it. Imagine I want to send some goodies over to the user group. I take a box, I throw things into it. Maybe I'll throw a few pens in there, a few stickers in there, and, and a few other things, and I would seal the seal the box and you know send it. Now, what would I expect Mike, for example, to receive? I'm hoping Mike will receive this entire box. What if instead he receives one or two stickers and a letter saying, sorry, we lost everything? That's called US Postal Service, right? <laughs> that happens to me quite often, right? They send a sorry note and two things. It's like, where's my damn box? And it's gone. Well, but that's not the way it should be, should be done. So you want to send the, you send the parts, but the receiver receives the whole. And that's exactly the way you built it. You are building the packages, but the receiver receives the entire module. Well, enough of that. Let's take a look at how this is going to work. How do we define a module? Well, before we get to the code itself, here's a little piece of a build script. Nothing really exciting. I blow away the output directory, create an output slash mlib directory, create a classes directory under output, build every piece of Java code in the first directory, compile the jar into a first.jar, and then blow away the classes directly. So you look at this and say, hmm, nothing really uh, different from what we used to do in Java exactly, right? So nothing really uh, new at this point. So if you look at the directory right now, just a build file, nothing else. I'm gonna go ahead and create a file right here. In this case, I'm gonna say make directory, we'll create a first directory, under which we'll create a com slash agile developer, and we'll create the directory called first. As you know, this is the package name called com.agiledeveloper.first that I'm gonna create at this point. So within this first, what I wanna do is create a first.java. So what does the first.java contain? It contains a package in this case, and the package is gonna be com agile developer first, and within this I create a class called first, and within this class first, let's simply say, oh, let's go ahead and say get info, and all I'm gonna do is simply return this is first. So nothing really exciting, it's just the plain old Java as we once used to create. So I'm gonna run the build at this point, and as you would expect the output that it contains, the first uh, jar we create. So nothing really exciting at this point. However, what I'm gonna do next is to create a directory again, and this directory is called second, under which I create a com agile developer, a second package. And within this, of course, I'm gonna say second.java. So the second.java, what does that contain? Well, this is gonna say package com agile developer second, and within this, let's create a class called second, but in this one, we'll create a static, let's say boy, main, and this main is going to simply print out right now, oh, let's say this is second. 
So that's a good starting point. I want to build this code right now. So let's go ahead and build this. This is going to be everything in the second directory. So we'll say second over here, and this becomes a second dot jar as you would do normally. So let's go ahead and fire up and run the build, and you can see the build went just fine. Well, how about running this piece of code really quickly? So we'll say Java minus class path, and in this case, of course, output mlib, and this is going to be second dot jar, and of course, com agile developer second dot second, which is the class I really want to run. So again, like the way we normally run things, I'm going to run it. And you can see that that word is that this is second. However, I go to the second one more time. I'm going to do an import right now, com agile developer first dot first. And within this, of course, we will say uh, first is equal to new first. And let's output first.get info. And of course, you should say this is first at this point. Now, for this to work, as we know, I'm going to go back over here and say this is going to be output mlib slash. This is going to be first.jar. But not only over there, we need to bring that into the build as well. So we'll say minus class path and then provide that directory or the jar file right in there. So if I go back and run that code this time, you can see that it says this is second, this is first. Well, the point I really wanted to make here is we did not do anything different at all. This seems like life as usual. And in fact, it is even when you are using your Java 13. So when you build your code, this is one of the tenets of Java, isn't it? What worked before will work now. Well, that's almost true. So in the past, it used to be what worked before works now. Now it is what worked before should work now. So mostly it should work. And remember, because of modules, they have made a few things more secure. So occasionally, you may get a few errors if you are kind of sneaking and using stuff you're not supposed to use in the first place. But for the most part, things still work. So we didn't build the code any differently. We didn't write the code any differently. We didn't run the code any differently. Life as usual, as you can see. But of course, that is simply creating a, a regular uh, 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 code. However, what about modules? Well, in order to modularize it, first of all, let's do a jar minus f output mlib, let's say second dot jar, and I'm going to say minus d. So that's a very useful option for you to look at. The minus d option simply tells you, reveal your secrets, tell me your dependencies. So this is where you're querying the metadata. And you're saying, hey, I want to know what your dependencies are. Could you please tell me? When I run the code, it says I don't have any module descriptors because we didn't write any special code for modules. And it says derive automatic module. We'll talk about what that is in a few minutes. But it does say that my, my module depends on Java base, which is mandatory. So even if you don't require it, it always is required. And it says your, your module contains the second package. Leave the thought aside. This will become a little bit more clearer when we start writing modules in a few minutes. But how do we write a module? The first thing I'm going to do here is to go to the first directory. And remember, this is the package we have. At the mouth of the package, right there at the very top, you write a file called modulinfo.java. Well, before touching this file, let's take a look at it for a minute. Notice how this completely breaks the convention that we are used to in Java. In Java, we always use the Pascal notation. You start with an uppercase and you use the mixed case for the file names. Well, this one doesn't follow that convention. It's all lowercase module dash info and a dot Java. That's the first thing. What do you do within this file? You write a module in here. You said, wait a second, are we in trouble? We are defining something as a module after all. What if I have a module in my code already? That's a really good concern. Why is it so important concern? Because I know what you're thinking. Because you've been burned by this in the past, and those scars are still hurting, isn't it? Because this is what we did in Java 5, isn't it? I really wanted to write 
for each string, name in names. That's what I really wanted to write, but we couldn't. Why? Because when they created for each, they found that people were using for each as method names and variable names. So they said, don't it, let's use for. And then they found out that people are using in as a variable name and method name. What can I say? There are really sick people out there. <laughs> so as a result, they couldn't use in as a keyword, so they chose a colon instead. I cry every time I write this code because my heart wants to write for each in, but my fingers have to type for and a colon, isn't it? But it didn't end over there, unfortunately. Remember the time of Java 8, what happened? Well, they wanted to really create an interface util, and within the interface, they really wanted to provide some kind of an implementation of a method. Now, how do you say that you're implementing a method? I don't know, you could choose a thousand keywords, isn't it? You could say defined, or you could have said whatever you want to say, but it doesn't matter. What you choose here, there is somebody among the 10 million Java programmer who has already used it in the code. So what did they do? They used a default. Now the reason we call it a default method is not coincidental. If you ever meet the switch statement, never bring up this topic. Switch is very angry still because the default was part of switch and they stole it. You know, it's kind of like the younger child feeling the anger because, you know, the elder child feeling the anger because the younger child got something. That's the way this feels, isn't it? And the switch is still bitter because the default was this, but they took it away, isn't it? Well, just for the sake of records, I'm not complaining by any set of imagination. I'm actually happy that it's a default method and not a colon method, honestly. <laughs> but the point really is that every time we introduce something new, there's this fear of, oh gosh, how do we not conflict with keywords? Well, here's the first good news. Module, thankfully, is not a keyword. So if you said int module, for example, is equal to four, Notice when I go back and compile this code, the code has no problem at all compiling. I'm not suggesting that you start today and start defining variables called modules, unless you hate everybody that you work with and want to confuse them, right? But if you already have code which uses module, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to start refactoring them after all. So module is not a keyword, it's a contextual keyword. So only within the module info.java, the word module means something special. So in this case, you can say module, com agile developer, the first, that's a name I gave for this, just to keep it different from my package name. Now, of course, the question is, can my module name be the same as uh, my package name? Well, to be confused is your human right. There's nobody can stop you from doing it. But I would urge you not to do that, but Java doesn't care if you do. So generally speaking, don't mix the names because it's confusing, but in Java it's perfectly fine if you want to keep the module name as one of your package names. It doesn't really have any problem with it. So we created a, a module called the first right here, but then I'm going to create a second module info.java, and this one is going to be called as the second, that's what I'm going to call it. So now that we created these two, what are we going to do? We need to create this module and we want to use it. So to do this, we compile all the Java files in the first directory, and we're going to compile all the Java files from the second directory, but we are going to use a module path. So we have two words now. The class path is the old stuff. But now we have what's called a module path. A module path is the whole new word where you can put your modules. If you are called, whether you want to put your job in the class path or whether you want to put the class in the job in the module path. If you put it in the module path, you got a privilege. You put it in the class path, it's old stuff. So how do you say that you're going to use a module path? Well, you say instead of minus class path, you put the word letter P. Why did they choose P for module path? Because it's so intuitive, isn't it? So essentially, this is basically saying that you have a module path, and within the module path, you have a first.jar. 
But you can specify the job file, or you can just specify the directory itself. That's perfectly fine. Similarly, I come along here and I put this P here. Well, remember, if you had 600 jar files, maybe you were that person with that luxurious position to list all the 600 jar files at work. Well, you don't have to do that anymore. You can simply specify just the directory or directories, or if you really want to still list all the jar files, knock yourselves out, nobody can stop you from doing it. So this is more flexible, as you can see. You can specify that right there and say that's where I want to put it. Now, of course, this is a visual thinking. This code will not work yet for a few different reasons. What is the first thing I'm going to do? I need to say minus M, where M stands for the name of the module, and, and I'm going to say com agile developer d second slash, and then specify the second. So this is a way to specify that you are really interested in the, the com agile developer second dot second, but that hails from the module called com agile developer dot the second. So yes, please. But why specifying the module if there's a requirement that no two packages will have the same name in different modules? That's right. So no two packages can have the same name uh, in, 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 in two different places. However, the package name uh, is, uh, is not a qualifier. You still need to say where it's coming from. Why? Well, it has to go on through 600 of your jar files looking for it, isn't it? And now that it has a dependency graph, if you tell what module it's coming from, it's a great lookup, right? It doesn't have to be searching at this point. So that just makes it easier to say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Yeah, so you're right that you cannot have the package in multiple places, but this is a, you know, hey, where are you part of? That's where it's coming from. Uh, also keep in mind, I'm not suggesting we do this, but we do have default packages too, right? <laughs> not that you and I would use it ever, right? So, so package name is not always required in theory. Um, all right, so given this, of course, we have the module name specified. Why would this possibly not work? Well, think of this as a handshake. I'm not going to shake your hand if you don't extend your hand. You're not going to shake my hand unless we both extend our hands, right? That's exactly the point. On one side, you've got to export your packages. On the other side, you have to require the module. If there is no export or there is no requires, it's not going to work. And we don't have either one of them in this case. So let's give it a try. So let's go ahead and run the build. What does it tell us? Notice it tells us there's an error. And it says, first is not visible. Then it goes on to say that package com.agilelooper.first well, first of all, let's give credit where credit should be given. For the first time ever, an error message that humans can actually understand, <laughs> isn't it? I mean, you look at this. In the past, you would all, always call seven of your colleagues, and they would give their opinions about what this error is. And in this case, it simply says, hey, package first he is declaring the module the first, but module the second does not read it. So that's pretty darn clear what the problem is, isn't it? All right, so what are we gonna do? Let's go to the second, and in the second, I'm gonna say requires com agile developer, and I'm gonna say the first, and I'm gonna require. So this says, hey, on the second module, uh, I want you to know that I have a dependency on the first module. Now, of course, you know the code won't work at this point also. Why? Because the first module has not exported anything. Let's pause for a second and, and discuss that a little bit further. So what does that tell us? You remember my class is declared as public, but public is no longer public. Public plus export is public. Public without export means none of your business. So essentially, what you write may be public, but you separately decide whether you want to make that available, meaning visible to the outside world. So if you don't want something to be visible, you can make it public, but it's not available to the outside world uh, unless you export it. And, and so as a result, we haven't exported this yet. 
So when I do the build at this point, the error says, first is declared in the module, the first, which does not export. So as a result, it says, sorry, you cannot use this after all because you have not really exported it. So as a result, nobody should be able to use it. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go back here and say exports com agile developer first, and I'm going to export that particular package for the outside world to use. So if I go back and run the build this time, notice that everything went through and it was able to execute it. But here's a good time to examine the dependency. So if you say jar minus f output mlib and look at the first dot jar minus d, notice it says my dependency is on base, Java base, and I export the first package. On the other hand, if I go back over here and ask for second dot jar, then it tells me that my requires is on Java base, but it also requires the first and it contains but doesn't export the second package. So, so essentially, all that metadata is part of your jar, which is really nice, isn't it? Because in the past, if you find a jar file, and if somebody asks you, what are the dependencies, the, the usual response is a shrug, right? I'm like, how do I know? Go look for the palm file and look into it, right? So in this case, the metadata is part of the jar, and you can just examine it right away and find it. So, so that's basically what we did. We built the module at this point, please. So, so just so I understand, um, anything I reference in the second, if I try to use that module, it's going to say, oh, it's not there because we didn't export it. Uh, yeah, or we're only get an error when I try to build it. Uh, so uh, you are almost correct. You are right. So if, if you are a user of the second, you are pretty much can't do anything with it. You got an empty box, so to say, right? Because you, you got the box with no permission to use anything from it. Uh, I said almost because uh, Java ultimately has all the rights. That's why Java was able to use second, but you can't use second in your code. So, so Java has more privilege than you and I would. So, so that when you executed Java, it was able to call main in the second, but had I written a piece of code in another module and tried to call second, it will not work. So it's, yeah, absolutely right. Thank you. Sure. And, and so, so that's basically what we have right now is that limitation. Let's go a little further with this. Let's examine a slight difference and see how this is going to behave. So let's go back to the first module and let's create a helper.java. So what is helper? Helper is going to be in the package called com agile developer first. As you know, we exported this package, but this is a public interface called helper. The helper contains a add function, which takes an add A and B, and that's all the helper contains. This is just a plain vanilla interface. Now, keep in mind, in all the things you saw me so far, the writing code, I didn't do anything special at the code at all. Except for the module info file, the Java code was no different at all. It was the same as it was before. That's exactly the point. There's no new syntax at all in the, in the language or modules. So given this, of course, you see this interface given here. But let's go a little further with this. I want to create a, uh, in here a directory under first come agile developer, but we will create an input. Now the input sounds really nasty. You would never want to give this to other people, isn't it? So uh, first come agile developer input, and here's a helper input .java. Now clearly, this is not intended for other people to use, isn't it? So package com agile developer info, and what we're going to do with the info? Public class called helper info, and this implements the helper interface. Now obviously, where's the helper coming from? So I have to import, if you will, the uh, import the com agile developer uh, first dot helper because that's where the helper is coming from. So uh, as a result, I'm going to say public int add function takes an A and a B, and I'm going to simply say add called on helper info, and I'm going to return A plus B. So that seems like a very straightforward implementation, isn't it? But then in addition to this, 
I'm going to write a public function here called secret. But before we implement the secret, keep in mind, secret is not part of the interface. It's only a method in that implementation class. So when you call secret, all I'm going to do is just put that word. And so that's my secret function. I'm going to leave it there. What are we going to do next? I go to a build at this point, and of course, we're not really changing anything in the usage. It recently worked still, nothing really exciting. What I'm going to do next is to go to the first. In the first, I'm going to say public helper. We'll call it get helper. And this says return new com agile developer input dot helper input. And I'm going to return an instance of the helper uh, input. Now notice, helper is part of the same package. It is visible because the package is exported. Helper input is not, it is not visible to the client. <coughs> Let's go run the code. And when I build the code right now, it is not a problem. But out of curiosity, Let's do a jar minus f output envelope first minus d. Well, notice you export the first, um, you export first, but you contain input. You're not exporting input. So quickly you can examine and find out what is given out, what's not given out. Your module contains seven packages, but you chose to export two. Now the other files are internal to your module. So you didn't run the code for uh, it, 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 We have not done, done that yet. Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Yeah, we're just examining what's given and what's given, not given, and an input is not visible to the outside word at this point. Now, let's go to the second. In the second, what I'm going to do here is say helper, helper is equal to, oh, you know, before that, to make it abundantly clear, input.helper input uh, h is equal to null. I don't even want to bother creating an object. I don't even want to bother calling the static method. You are forbidden from even mentioning the name because you're not supposed to know that it even exists, isn't it? So when I refer to the name on line 12, what's going to happen? The compiler pretty much says, sorry, you can't do it. Why not? Impl is declared in the module the first, which does not export it. So it's not visible to you. You can't mention the name. You cannot talk to it. So the class is not available, even though it's public, because it's not exported. The package is not exported. You cannot see it. Having said that, helper, helper, and you know that helper is available to you because it's part of your package that's visible, isn't it? So helper, helper is equal to, I'm going to say first dot get helper. Now remember, get helper is part of first. First is visible. Helper is visible. Get helper is visible, so you should be able to call it. So then I say output in this case, and I want to simply output the helper right there. So when I run the code this time, what do you notice as an output? It says com agile developer info helper info. Now keep in mind, you didn't really break any encapsulation at this point. That is a two string methods output. And two string simply tells you whatever it wants to tell you, and you spoke to it using a helper interface which is visible to you, and technically speaking, you don't know that it's a helper implementation at this point. But on the other hand, you know, we have, have you know, a, a, a little idea here to say, what if I can cast it? So I can say over here, a com agile developer input dot helper info, and I'll take this helper, and I'll try to cast it. That's a no-go. You cannot mention the name of the class. So that won't work. There's no point in that program at all. Okay, so for so good. Then I say helper.add one comma two, and I'm gonna print up the result of calling the add function. Now remember you're calling the add function through the public interface. That's what you're doing in this case. So when I go back and run this code this time, notice the add was called on the helper input, and the result is a three. 
but you went through the interface, so that's a legitimate entry point, and you are accessing this that property. Fine. Now, at this point, you are thinking, hmm, I'm almost there. I can I can feel it, but it is the interface of the helper. But under the implementation, there is a secret method. Maybe we should be able to get to it. But remember, the compiler says, no, 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 you can't mention the name. But I know what you're thinking. I can see it in your face already. You're saying, but well, I'm an expert Java programmer, and you roll your sleeves with the reflection, isn't it? <laughs> and so now what are you going to do? You go back over here and say, import java.lang.reflect.star. Now, before we go further, reflection in Java in the past was more of a recommendation than a requirement, isn't it? If you have a private method, you call it using reflection, what will you get? You'll get an access violation exception. And so what do you do? You say set accessible to true, and then you call the private method. And Java says, of course, right? <laughs> so the point really is, it didn't stop you at all. So encapsulation was a joke. And encapsulation was like locking the door and leaving the key on the door, right? And, and it's like, if you want to use it, here's the key, by the way, but I hope you don't. So it was not really effective. And secondly, when people were told, don't use something, any market non-public, people just kind of used it. So, you know, in general, things like don't do doesn't really help. You know what, I, I can feel this pain already. Uh, you know, Java, of course, you know, they have to deal with 10 million people. I usually have to only deal with 10 people, but it's still frustrating. Uh, I have a wiki page, I'm, I'm, you know, all seriousness. I, a few years ago, I had a wiki page, and, and people enter some data on the wiki, and I have another wiki page where I put entries after I process it. And I'm not even kidding with you. In this 40 points, in red color, I have written, do not edit. And guess what people do? They edit. And you're like, what part of do not edit don't you understand? And you know, I can get angry with them. And you know what, a lot of times I realize it is me in their shoes most of the time also. Because I'm not reading stuff. And I remember one day, what changed my mind was, I was listening to, I was in a client site. And, and I was you know, standing there with, uh, with a drink in my hand. And, and one person was so angry at me and said, you're not supposed to drink here. I said, really? I'm sorry, I didn't know. And that only made the person even more angry. And I thought, why is this person so angry? This was the third day in the building. I'm not even kidding with you. And then I looked at the word walls and I was seriously ashamed and shocked. Because there was a red patch on the wall everywhere. It says, no drink, no drink, no drink. <laughs> and I'm like, why did they even read this stuff, right? <laughs> so the point is, we humans don't read stuff. And, and so if you really want to enforce something, do it. And that's exactly what I did on the wiki page. I withdrew permission from people to make read only. Now people are like, I can edit it. Like, uh-huh. Right? So <laughs> absolutely, right? So exactly, enforce it is the only way to do it. Don't just tell people to read because we just don't. So how do we really deal with reflection? So if we go back to this code, I'm going to say method and method over here. Method is equal to what am I going to do? I'm going to say helper dot get class, and then once I get the class, I'm going to say get method, and the method is called the secret method, and I'm going to output the method right here. What's going to happen if I try to run that code? Of course, Java says, hey, you need to catch the exception. Uh, don't you have to deal with it? But of course, as expert Java programmers, we know exactly how to take care of that. So we'll just go on and say, throw <laughs> exception and go on, right? So now what's going to happen? And then, of course, go back and build the code. And notice right there, you got the method. And now that you have access to the secret method, what can you do? Did you just notice your pulse just went up one beat, right? And you're like, my gosh, can I just go call this now? So method.invoke, and then what are we invoking this on? On the helper. 
Now, now, when you are getting, when you even think of it, if you look down at the Java compiler, you will notice that Java compiler is doing this to you. It says I'm watching you. Right, you're pretty close over there to make that method call. Now, if you do this, there's only one documentation you can write for this. Because this is called an act of war. Because you are reaching all the encapsulation at this point. So if you were to run this code right now, you're going to get an exception. And it tells you illegal access exception. The class second in the module, the second, cannot access helper implementation in the first because the module the first, the, I mean, come on, it's like, it, it cannot be any more descriptive, is it? <laughs> they pretty much lays it down and says, you know what, you can't do this, right? So, so in other words, when you don't export something, you cannot use it at compile time. And you cannot use it at runtime using reflection either. So it is fully encapsulated at that point. Now, obviously, you may say, all right, I can understand why I may not want to use something at compile time, but I really want to use this at runtime using reflection. Maybe I don't want compile time dependency, but I do want to have a plugin where I pull this in at runtime and use this object. Can I do it? And the answer, of course, is yes. So what you can do is you can go to the module, the first, and you can say, hey, I'm exporting the first, but I'm not going to export the uh, impl. However, I want to open the impl, so it opens impl for reflection. So what does this do for you? If you compile the code, notice that you are able to use the code now at runtime. However, if you try to go to the code now and say a helper over here, for example, if you were to say a uh, com agile developer, uh, a impl dot helper impl, uh, let's say uh, h is equal to null, well, you cannot do that because you don't have compile time access, so that failed compilation, as you can see, impl is not visible to you at compile time. So even though you cannot use it at compile time, you do have the permission now to use it at runtime. Again out, of curio oops, uh, uh, again, out of curiosity, let's talk about what does the metadata look like. So if I go to jar, a jar minus F, output mlib, oh, let's go ahead and ask for the first dot jar minus D. Notice it says it, it does open IMPL for reflective access. So, so that gives you an idea about how you can make something available for compile time, make something available for runtime, or not make it available at all as visibility, you can do all of that. So that shows you an example of how you're able to uh, create your modules and how the permissions work as well. Now with that said, let's talk about some rules and, and how things behave. So the first thing I wanna emphasize here is that any jar running in the class path is called an unnamed module. Now, there are three kinds of modules available in Java. So what are the three kinds of modules? They are called unnamed modules. So the unnamed modules, a uh, module, and then you have automatic modules, and then finally you have explicitly named modules. So these are the three things available, unnamed module, automatic modules, and explicitly named mo modules. So what are these three things? Well, the first rule is any jar running in the class path, that is legacy, uh, is, uh, is called an unnamed module. So in other words, if you have 70 jar files, you take those 70 jar files, you wrote in Java 7 or Java 8, and you run them on Java 13 in the class path, the 70 jar files all get together and form this one big happy family. And that one happy family is called the unnamed module. So there is exactly one unnamed module in your entire application running in the JVM. So, so all the things in the class path belong to one unnamed module. 
Now, you may say, all right, that's great. I can understand the legacy jar files, but I create a module. I create a module descriptor, the module-info file. So it's a full-fledged module. And I'm going to drop it into a class path. What's going to happen? You lose all your privileges. And at this point, that module becomes what? Part of the unnamed module also. Let's prove that actually. Let's go back to this code. In the first dot jar, what I'm going to do is say this is first and plus we will say first dot class dot get module. That's a new function in a class. It's called the get module function. And the get module function will give you what module the class belongs to. So then in the second, similarly, we will say this is second, and we will then say plus second dot class dot get module. Well, I'll put the module in both of those. Now, if you look at the code itself for a minute, when I do the build, notice I'm going to run this code in the class path. So I'm going to say class path. And what do I want to say here? Slash second dot jar. And then colon output slash angular first dot jar. And then slash. Let's go ahead and just remove all that minus stuff and run the second. Even though we built it as a module, we are running it in the class path. When we run in the class path, what's going to happen? So notice it runs in the class path, but notice it's an unnamed module. And notice it says unnamed module here as well. And, and let me go ahead and remove that stuff we don't care about at this point, which is in the second, let's get rid of this part right here. So we'll just focus on the top portion alone for, for this example. So when I run the scope notice, they are unnamed. But not only are they unnamed module, notice this is ending with B1 and B1. That tells us that they both are part of the same exact unnamed module. There is only one of them. So, so this is exactly running in that one unnamed module. However, we take exactly the same jar files, no recompilation, no rebuilding, but I simply run this one more time. But this time, notice I put a P in here, and I remove this lengthy description or list here, and I say minus M, and this becomes a com agile developer, the second slash. Now, what do you expect them to be? In specific modules. But these are explicitly named modules. How so? Because they have an explicit name that we provided. And what is the name? The name is called the second or the first, and that's the name we provided for that. So you can see how we have unnamed modules and explicitly, explicitly named modules. However, going back to the scope for a second, let's go to the first, take the module info, and move it as FM. Go to the second module info, move it as SM. There's no more module descriptor in these two directories, as you can see. With no module descriptor, I'm going to simply run them in the class path. I'm going to specify the minus class path here. And this becomes first.jar. And this becomes a minus class path. And when I run this code, what's going to happen when I run this in the class path? Well, remember, these are traditional jars at this point, isn't it? because they are just simply jars with no module descriptors. So what are they going to be? Unnamed module, as we know. So when you run it, it says they are unnamed modules. However, you can take a Java 7 jar file, or a Java 8 jar file, or any jar file created in any version of Java in the past with no module descriptor. And you can put them into the module path. And when you put them into the module path, what happens? Java says, look, there's a module here on the module path. Let me examine it. Oh, look, there's no module descriptor. Because there's no module descriptor, this is an automatic module. So what does Java do? It does you a favor. 
it does you a favor by even <coughs> requiring everything you need automatically. That's why it's called an automatic marketing. It also does you a favor by exporting all of your packages. So when, if you have seven packages in your jar, automatically all the seven get exported. And automatically everything you need gets required or uh, read automatically. That's why it's called an automatic marketing. So when I run the code, what's going to happen now? Well, first of all, it won't run. Why not? Because remember, the minute you put this in the marketing tab, you better tell me what the marketing name is. So I'm going to say the name is M. Come at, sorry, now the name is second because that's the name of the jar file. Now, by default, the name of the jar becomes the name of the module. Now, there are two responses you, you're going through in your mind almost concurrently, isn't it? The first response is, that's cool. And immediately, before you end that, the second response is, what's the catch? Right? Because if that's a convention, can something be broken? Well, if you name your file with weird things in it, it's going to really mess up. So there's ways to work around it. We'll come back to that a little bit later, and we'll talk about it. So going back and running this code, what do we notice? Notice now, when we run that code it, with the module path, it tells us the module is second, and the module is first. So the name of the jar became the name of the automatic module. And what does it do? It automatically exports all its packages. It automatically requires everything it needs. And so that is wired automatically for you. So what have we noticed so far? Any jar running in the class path is called an unnamed module. Any jar running in the module path is automatic module if it's a traditional jar file. On the other hand, any jar with a module descriptor running in the class path is still an unnamed module. Running in the module path becomes an explicitly named module. And so that's how you know which one is which. And then finally, of course, we talk about this Modules cannot share packages. They're not allowed to share packages. That's another rule. Now, here are a few default rules to keep in mind. First, unnamed modules can talk to other unnamed modules. They better do, isn't it? Because otherwise, traditional Java will be broken. So the old code worked, and the old code mostly should work. So that's basically the idea. Second, Automatic module can talk to other automatic modules. So if you bring the code over to automatic modules, they simply work. Automatic modules can talk to unnamed modules. So if you make one module automatic and another one unnamed, if automatic calls into unnamed, that still works. So if the dependency direction is from module path to class path, it works. By default, however, unnamed modules cannot talk to automatic modules. This is just a default behavior. And the reason is the module path is not brought in automatically because the dependency doesn't express it. You have to really explicitly ask it to go load those up otherwise. Similarly, an explicit name module can talk to other explicit name modules. Explicit can talk to automatic and explicit cannot talk to unnamed modules. So this is again, you cannot go from the secure word all the way to the unsecure word without going in turn to an automatic module. And finally, an explicit module has to require any module it needs. That's why it's an explicit name module. You gotta say what are the things you require, you gotta say what are the things you export. And including automatic modules you gotta say that in your requires. Now here comes one small problem. Explicit modules export only what they export, but automatic modules get an automatic name. What if the name is not a good name? What if it's an old name that you used and you don't like the jar file's name? And if you release it, you will start using it, and you change the name, they're gonna be angry at you, isn't it? So what you can do is you can specify a manifest information called automatic module name and you can take a diffs on a name. 
Let me give you an example of how you can do that. So if you go to the second, uh, uh, the second one, I'm going to say automatic module name.txt. You can call it whatever you want to call it. The file name doesn't matter. So I just call it amn uh, here dot txt. Then I say automatic uh, module name, and I'll say wonderful, and that's all I did. I gave a name called wonderful. Now remember, what was the name of this module before I made the change? The name of the module minus f output envelope second minus d, the name is automatic called second. The name of the jar becomes the name of the module. But now that we define an automatic module name to be wonderful, what we're gonna do then, I go to the build the file, and in the build, notice when I'm building the jar, I'm gonna say over here, a minus m and second slash automatic module name dot txt. So I just refer to that file uh, with the minus m option. So now I go back and run the build, what's gonna happen? Well, it's complaining, it doesn't know what second is. That's because this is no longer second, it's wonderful because that's the name I provided for it, isn't it? So when I run that code now, it works. Of course, if you really want to make sure, you can say jar minus f, output envelope second dot jar minus d, even though the final name is second dot jar, the name is wonderful, and it's still an automatic module because there's no module descriptor. So this simply goes into the manifest file. So that brings us to talking about how to go from legacy to modules. Now, first thing I want you to keep in mind is what worked before mostly works now. And I say mostly because if you are a good citizen and you use products that were good citizens, then you're using only what you are legitimately allowed to use. So your code should still work mostly when you put them in the class tab. But on the other hand, if you are using stuff that you are not supposed to use in the past, then you're going to get errors or warnings depending on which one you're using. So mostly it should work. Okay, your code, you're going to take your old legacy code, you want to move it into Java 9 and later, how do you do it? First question, we, my code is in Java 8. I want to move forward. I'm going to modularize it, maybe. Should I go to Java 9, and then to 10, and then to 11, then to 12, then to 13, and then to 14, which will be out in a few weeks, isn't it? Well, the answer is yes, if you'd like to take pain over and over and over, you gain nothing doing it. Well, remember what's going to happen. You go to 9, you struggle, you make all the effort, make it work and you celebrate that it works, and you go to 10, and things don't work anymore. Why? Because the things you depend on were moved in 10. You know what, you might as well take the beating once, isn't it? And be done with it. So if you're on eight, just keep all the way going, all the way to 14. Don't stop anywhere in between. There is nothing you gain by going incremental. So go all the way to 14 and be happy. Now, how do we make the transition? The first and foremost, start with your legacy code. I've got this running in H. I'm going to start with what's in H. I'm going to take that code. What's the very first step? Run them all in the class path in the old job. You know, I'm a consultant. I go to companies to help people. And when I go there, the first question I ask them is, does your code work? And you know what they say always? Yes. Then I fold my hands and say, show it to me. Because one thing I learned in my life, you touch a broken code, you own the problem. So you never want to do that, right? So does it work? And they say, yes, through it. And if it doesn't work, fix it, and I'm going to talk to you after that, right? Because you don't want to encounter a problem when you're trying to help them to solve a particular problem. You don't want to take other problems. Well, if it works, great. If not, let's fix that first. Don't worry about Java 9 or later. Hey, this is great. 
our code works in old Java. What do you do? Don't recompile. Don't make any changes. Just take the class job files, dump them in the clear span, and run them in the modern Java. Run them in Java 13, Java 14. Question, does it work? Why possibly it may not work? Any, any ideas? What could possibly be the reason why it worked on Java 8, but it doesn't work on Java 13? What could be wrong? Uh, yeah, they are going to want to put it small, but remember, the JDK is still the same. Some modules are removed. Not quite yet, because it's still in the class, but they're almost there. Well, the, the, the things that got removed, possibly. Your code depends on core bar, right? Or your code depends on Java FX. And what if those things are not available readily? And you need to say, oops, they're gone. We got to bring them as external dependencies now, right? So if things were removed, possibly your code may not work. And then you need to fix that. Or your breach encapsulation <coughs> with things that you know were uh, removed for uh, the sake of making it safer, and you may have to change the code to do something else, please. Oh yeah, yeah. That, 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 all that did change. Yes. Yeah. And then you, you mentioned, okay, well, maybe you're using Java FX. So is there is there a module list, and we'll just like require that module and all of the stuff? Yes, yes, stuff yes, is yes, in no. Module or no, 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 sorry. Okay. Yes, and no. Okay. Uh, Corva is not. So if you really want Corva, you gotta get it from somewhere else. Okay. They're not, they're not providing it. And, and that's a pain. Uh, I actually have a client, um, and I was naive. I did not know. On the very first day over there, I made a joke. It's like, anybody needs Korba? And nobody laughed in the room. And I looked at them and said, we are using Korba, aren't we? And they said, uh-huh. I said, what part of Korba are you using? And this is all of it. And it was not fun at all. They have huge dependency on Korva, and, and there was no replacement for it, and, and uh, you have to go get it from the other side. Uh, part of the challenge was the folks maintaining Korva, you know, they're like, yeah, but this is not a full time job. We'll get to it when we can. And, you know, you know understandably so, right? You know, uh, a lot of times uh, the people who are doing these open source projects have other things like life and work. And so they're like, yeah, we want to move it, but we may not move it at the pace in which you want us to move. And that becomes a challenge as well. So, so it can be a, a problem. It depends on what you're using. So, so it's important to uh, you know, check that critically. Um, OK, it works. What do I do? Run them all in the marketing app. What could possibly go wrong? The split packages system. The split packages can be a problem because your packages are split across two different modules and, uh, sorry, your pa yeah, two different modules, job files rather, not modules at this point, and you fire them up in the class path and everything works. You take them and put them in the module path, what happens? Java is like, wait, this, this package is in two modules, it kicks us both out, right? So, so it won't even run, it'll fail right away. Now, uh, give names then to automatic modules. I'm fixing that, of course. Give names to automatic modules. Now, before we go further, step back for a minute. Let's think through that a little bit. We can agree to this and walk away, but there's a legitimate time when you're going to have two jars with the same package in both the jobs. <coughs> Any idea when? Council uh, libraries? Uh, well, I said let's do Okay. Uh, unit test. Okay. Your unit test is the same package as your code being tested. Okay. Potentially in a different jar, isn't it? 
So when you take your code and bring the unit test forward, what's going to happen? It won't work. How do you fix it? It's not a problem at all. That's why you don't have to write unit test. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, that's a legitimate problem, isn't it? So if you're following the convention, where your unit test is in the same package as your class, and we normally do, what do we do? Well, Java gives you a little bit of a backdoor. And the backdoor is when you compile and when you run, you can use what's called a patch module. And a patch module is a compiler and a runtime option. And the patch module says, hey, you, you see this jar file? That content of the jar file is not in that module anymore. It's in my module. So you're patching your module with the classes from the other module. That's what you're doing here. So the patch module is very useful for that kind of situation. And again, the documentation says, don't uh, you know abuse that feature. It's really for these special situations. And so don't patch everything. Uh, that's not the intention. Uh, so you do want to have a corporate police from time to time take a look at your build so, so people don't just abuse that feature and do things. And then, of course, take your automatic modules, give them an automatic module name. Why do we do this? Because you don't want the jar file name to be your automatic module's name. By giving a legitimate name today, you can take your time to convert them to an exclusive name module. And then when you do, you will use that name in the future. So you're taking a tips on the name for the future, which is a good idea, right? And then finally, of course, convert. This is the part that's a little confusing. Okay, it's a lot confusing. Convert from top to the bottom to explicit modules. Now, the reason it's confusing is you have one module here. You have another module here. Your dependency is this way, isn't it? Now, what do we tell people in the past? You normally say, if you want to do anything, take the one that has no dependency. Because that's an easy one to work with, isn't it? So this is intuitive to us. This is the opposite of it. Because, let's think about it. If you take the one with no dependency, and if you elevate this to a module path as an explicit module, then your explicit module is sitting up here. Your automatic module has to talk to your explicit module at this point. And, and you can't do that by default. So you want to really go from top down high work. And that is something that's a little, you know, I'm not intuitive and we may struggle with it. So what you want to do is you if you look at this hierarchy here, start by converting jar one to an explicit name module first. Then convert jar two and then jar three and then come down to jar four. So go in that direction of dependency. And, and that's when you can just convert that each one of them and then do the one the one. Well, the question is, looks like a lot of effort, isn't it? Well, it is a lot of effort or it's not that much effort <coughs> depending on the situation you are in. If the code mostly does the right things, if you don't have split packages, if you're not using things that you're not supposed to use already, for most part, you do a little bit of work and things just work. Or you have a lot of slip packages and they have a lot of code that reaches encapsulation. Be ready to put a lot of effort fixing it. It is really hard to say what it is until don't get angry. That's just the nature of this, right? So it's just the way it is and we have to deal with it. And so the question really to ask is, should I bite the bullet? and convert the module, or should I not? Here's my recommendation. First question, how long do you plan to be at your job? <laughs> if you plan to quit in the next two months, don't do this. Just spend the two months, leave. If you plan to be there for a while, do it now. And the reason I say this, if I'm going to be there for a long term, I like to take the pain sooner than later. And the reason I don't like to postpone it is suddenly one day you'll get a call that says, we need to go to module 
and we didn't do it yesterday, and we want you to do it while you are releasing other features at the same time. They're not going to give you the luxury of taking a few months to do it, right? Because the business gets no value out of this. It is not a functional requirement, isn't it? So the business doesn't come to you and say, yeah, we'll give you two months to convert to my use because it's going to help us so much in the long run. <coughs> no. So we have to do this while we do other things. And so for that reason, just start planning towards it and keep moving. Because the sooner we take care of it, the sooner we can get it behind us. And it's a one-time cost. Once you make the change, you're in this you know, whole new beautiful world, and you can enjoy uh, moving forward from there, and you don't have to worry about uh, dealing with the module conversion after that point. So, so that's basically the idea is to make the transition you know, as, as soon as you can, so you don't have to uh, deal with it. So that's all I have. Any questions or comments, please?